Okay, good evening. I would like to welcome you all. And do I have a thumbs up from the tech crew that I can proceed? All right. So my name is Chris Chappell. I'm the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology and the founding director of the Master of Arts in Yoga Studies. As we all know, yoga has gone global at the best possible time. And as we will learn tonight in yet another way, yoga knows no boundaries. In other words, no one can claim to own yoga because by definition, it is beyond ownership. This has combined with its emphasis on human psychology has truly led to this moment in history when people from all walks of life, all persuasions, from religious to atheist, everything in between, to find a way within the pathways of life to not only understand happiness and unhappiness, but as we have recently learned, to come to the wisdom that our true nature lies beyond both. So I was listening as we've enjoyed these several days with Dr. Ganesh Rao, and I want to introduce you to him in a slightly more formal way. He did numerous graduate degrees at Bombay University. And for those who have not been to Bombay, it's a combination of New York City and Singapore um, in the 1970s, but it's, yeah, it's quite the lively city. And he has an MCOM, Master of Commerce, with a focus in, on accounting, which always comes in handy. He has a diploma of management studies, an MA in philosophy at which he attained the level of rank holder, a PhD in philosophy, the title of his dissertation, Critical Inquiry into the Meaning of Life. I love that combination. And he also has a diploma in naturopathy, a diploma in yoga ed from Kaivalya Dham, as well as a special one-year training as a specialist instructor in, um, in home nursing. And he just leaned over and whispered to me, he said, that's where you really learn how the human body works. We've been truly blessed in, to be in his company for these couple of days. And I want to really thank the graduate students who were huddling here and our program administrator and our senior administrative coordinator who we look like a, a cozy small group, but no, there are so many more that are um, participating that you don't see right now. And that was the case earlier today. We had more than twice the number of people zooming in. And if we can be grateful to COVID for anything, it's that we have become really adept, uh, amazing technology, related in many ways to yoga cities, okay? We can be many places at once now. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Lori, Dr. Lori Rubenstein Fazio, for making these connections at Kaivalya Dam, where I know myself personally, my wife and I have received wonderful hospitality on various occasions. And uh, Dr. Lori Fazio has truly cu cultivated and nurtured a sustained relationship. And we as a community look forward to visiting there again. For those of you that don't know, it's midway up the Deccan, halfway, a little bit closer to Pune than, than Mumbai, but in this beautiful resort town called Lonavala famous for its chicky, which is the best peanut brittle with all variations in the whole world. So Lori, would you like to come and uh, complete the introduction and invite Dr. Rao to the stage?
So I think some of you who were there this afternoon already heard me say this, but for those of you who weren't, when we first went to Kaivalya Dam and heard Dr. Rao speak, our minds were blown. I felt that he had this capacity to state complex concepts in a digestible and manner that made sense. And he has a mastery of the philosophy and a mastery of the application. And it's it's quite unique. And so we felt incredibly blessed to have time with him. And so to have him here with us is a double quadruple blessing. We're very, very grateful to have him here. And so I'm not going to talk anymore so that we can maximize the time that we have with him. So Dr. Rao, please. Before I start on philosophy, certain things practical to be done, and that is a small token of honor from Kevredham. Well, this is the normal way where we honor people. So on behalf of Kevredham, My delight and pleasure to be familiar, acquainted, and know Dr. Chris. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. On behalf of Kayalidham, please come. Okay. <laughs> Once again, would like to thank LMU for making this happen. Also to my colleague Deepak there for accompanying and being all the time in this nice experiences in LMU. On behalf of Kevladam, thanks to LMU once again. <clears throat> Let's get down to business. The topic that I have been given, you can see on the board there, concept of mind in Sankhya and yoga philosophy. Yeah. A very interesting topic. <clears throat> Patanjali's Yoga Darshana or Yoga Darshana per se is based upon Sankhya philosophy, Kapila's Sankhya philosophy, Sankhya Darshana. Both go hand in hand, as I mentioned in the last lecture. Sankhya is theoretical yoga, yoga is practical Sankhya. You cannot separate them. Very clearly, if somebody asks you, why are you doing asanas? It would be a very incomplete answer, juvenile answer to say, I am doing asanas to get fit. Very small, trivial answers. Why you are doing asanas in the whole scheme of yoga? comes in full perspective when you understand Sankhya philosophy. 
among the Astika Darshanas, six philosophies, Sankhya and Yoga together can be considered as Indian psychology. And when we come to psychology, the main subject is the mind. But before I go to the concept of mind, a little bit on Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya can be pronounced with N or M. Sankhya or Samkhya. Incidentally, both pronunciations make sense. When you pronounce with N, Sankhya or Sankhya, it refers to numbers. So Sankhya becomes a philosophy of 25 categories. There are 25 principles in Sankhya. And you, when you pronounce it with M, Samkhya, Samakhyati, right knowledge, knowledge which is liberating. So both words make sense there. Sankhya can be understood as an uncompromising dualism, atheistic realism, and spiritual pluralism. High sounding words in philosophy. But if you understand, it becomes very interesting. It makes our topic clearer if you understand. Uncompromising dualism. So Sankhya is a dualistic philosophy. When we say dualistic philosophy, we mean in Sankhya, there are two metaphysical principles. And for philosophy students here, metaphysical principles are principles which are assumed in a philosophy. And entire philosophy comes down from those metaphysical principles. Normally, we cannot question those metaphysical principles. For example, in a theistic philosophy, if you say God created the universe, you cannot ask who created God. God is a metaphysical principle. From there, entire philosophy comes. It's a theistic philosophy. In the same way, in Sankhya, the two principles are Purusha and Prakriti. Dualism. Two principles there. Uncompromising dualism means there is no compromise between the two. Neither Purusha comes from Prakriti nor Prakriti comes from Purusha. Both are independently existing, eternally existing principles. So it is uncompromising dualism. Atheistic realism. Theos means God. Theism means belief in God. Atheism means non-belief in God. Sankhya is an atheistic philosophy. When we say a philosophy is atheistic, we must be very clear that the follower of that, of that philosophy will not go on the roadside and proclaim there is no God in this universe. No, that is not what we mean by atheism in philosophy. Atheism or atheistic philosophy is that philosophy in which the creation of the universe, the preserving of the universe, and the destruction of the universe, Sristi, Stiti, and Pralaya, or Samhar, all three can be explained without the principle of God. So it is atheistic. Yeah. In Sankhya, Purusha and Prakriti are sufficient to explain how the universe evolves, how it is maintained, how it goes back. What is the place of human being in that universe? What is the purpose of human life? Everything can be explained without reference to God, the concept of God. So Sankhya is atheistic. Realism, atheistic realism. This is one feature of Sankhya philosophy because of which it appeals to most of us. Realism simply means this world is real. 
some of you who may not be philosophically initiated, they may think, what are you talking? World is real anyhow. No. As against realism, we have a school of philosophy called idealism. Idealism means only the mind is real and everything mental is real. So according to idealism, this world is a creation of the mind. There is no real world outside. It is our mind which is creating the world. That is idealism. And to a great extent, it is true. Because in this hall today, all of us sitting, we may assume that all of us are sharing one world. But I'm very sure that each one of us is living in her or own world created by her or own mind. We are not sharing the world at all. So idealism has a grain of truth there that your mind creates your world. If you take psychology, if you are happy, then everywhere you see happiness. Happiness is a projection of your mind. Sankhya is realism. The world is real. It is much more tangible for us to follow Sankhya. And spiritual pluralism. This is the point where all of us must understand. All Indian philosophies, with the exception of Charvakas, which is materialism, all Indian philosophies are spiritual philosophies. And when we say spiritual, we should be careful not to identify spirituality with religion. This has to be done because in the present day, the problems in the world are more because of religion and mainly because we are not spiritual. We have to be very clear. What do we mean by spirit? If you look at the definition of spiritual, spiritual means of the spirit. And if I go one step further, spirit means that which is not matter. What is matter? Matter is that which can be pursued by the sense organs. So that which cannot be pursued by the sense organs is the spirit in me, which is the spiritual part in me. All Indian philosophies start with the basic assumption that the consciousness in you can exist by itself. It can, it can, in grammatical terms, it can be considered as a noun. Where in Western philosophy, Western psychology, we talk about consciousness as object-oriented consciousness, intentional consciousness, or if I say I'm conscious, then if you can ask me, you're conscious of what? So when you talk about I'm conscious, I'm conscious of something. Consciousness is always a verb. Whereas in Indian philosophy, Consciousness is a noun. Understand the difference very clearly. Consciousness can exist by itself. That is pure consciousness, pure awareness. That is the goal of all meditation practices. Can I be that pure consciousness? Can I be that pure awareness? To cut short my elaboration, the consciousness in me is the spirit. And when... I aligned myself towards that consciousness. I term myself as spiritual. And before I go to further elaboration, aligning with consciousness is what we refer to as awareness, is what we refer to in the recently very popular term, particularly in this country, mindfulness. Mindfulness, awareness, witnessing aspect, Sakshi Bhav in Sanskrit, all of them are just states where you are more aligned to your consciousness rather than to the body and the mind. You can see, 
if you understand spirituality from that sense then there is no question of god coming there prayer my religion your religion nothing coming there i can be the most spiritual person without ever going to the temple not necessary so all indian philosophies are spiritual from that point of view some of them are theistic also and when we say sankhya is spiritual pluralism this is the part where sankhya distinguishes itself from all other indian philosophies pluralism stands for in each one of us the consciousness part when it attains to self realization state which in yoga and sankhya is kaivalya in jainism it's kaivalya maybe in buddhism nirvana in other indian philosophies moksha self realization when we attain to that state in sankhya that consciousness does not go and merge with any other consciousness it remains aloof there are as many purushas as many consciousness as there are living beings in the universe this is why we refer to sankhya as spiritual pluralism with a small background now we are coming to something we can touch in day to day life when we say sankhya is dualistic purusha and prakriti purusha is the principle of consciousness prakriti is the principle of matter two basic metaphysical principles sankhya says everything in the universe including human being is made up of purusha and prakriti everything in the universe everything in the universe has consciousness and has matter including human beings and just to repeat but for people who are attending for the first time so in sankhya if you see you take a stone it looks very inanimate sankhya will say in this stone consciousness approaches zero matter approaches infinity students of mathematics will understand what i am saying consciousness is not zero it is approaching zero almost not there a little bit there matter is almost infinite from stone when you come to plant life there is little bit more consciousness that little bit more is plants are growing so there is growth there in fact i repeat back home as children whenever we used to touch the plants at night our parents used to say don't touch the plants at night they are sleeping you are giving them life there is growth in the plants from the plants when you move to animals still little bit more consciousness that increase in consciousness is along with growth they have mobility they are moving from animals when you come to human beings the biggest question what is the difference in consciousness so two things first evolution is on the path of consciousness we cannot evolve physically we cannot have more power than an elephant any time in future our evolution is always on the path of consciousness and that is what thinkers like j krishnamurthy gurjev osho all of them talked about transformation of consciousness because the body and the mind done with it's a consciousness which has to evolve which has to grow which has to transform so one from the stone a uh, plant life animal life it's only the consciousness which is evolving we are considering only consciousness 
So from the animal life, when you come to the human life, where is the evolution happening? Human beings are also growing. Human beings are also moving. Where is the evolution? This is something to be understood. And this is the crux of yoga psychology. When we talk about yoga and Sankhya, considering mind, we are talking about going beyond the mind. What is that we are talking about? In the human beings, for the first time, there is a possibility of awareness happening. What is this awareness we are talking about? An animal is conscious, human being is conscious. What is the difference? The difference is the human being can be conscious of his own consciousness at the time when he's conscious. When I am talking to you, I can talk to you only because I'm conscious. All of you will agree. If I'm unconscious, I can't talk to you. I can talk to you only because I'm conscious. But at this point of time, when I'm talking, am I aware I'm talking? Big question mark. 99.9999 infinite percentage of human beings are not aware. What is this awareness? I can tell you I'm aware. At this point of time, when I am talking to you, I'm aware I'm talking. Because when I'm looking at the faces and seeing the gestures on the face, some frowns on the forehead, some intimations of smile on the lips, some nice gesture I'm following. When I'm looking at these gestures on the face, what I am talking goes on changing. Because when I look at some person not understanding, I take that sentence again and try to explain a different way that he or she understands. What is happening actually? What is happening is because of his awareness at the time when I am talking to you, I am responding to you real time. At this time, when a response is coming to you, I am responding on that manner. What do normal speakers who are not aware do? The normal speakers, normal teachers, normal professors, all of us. Prepare the lecture at home. Come and speak the lecture, give the lecture. Whether you understand or not doesn't matter. I am not aware. I'm just giving my lecture because I have prepared. I'm conscious I'm giving the lecture. Now I'll give you an example which will make it work more clear. When you get angry, you do the damage. Shout, yell, scream, hit someone, click a flower pot, go and sulk in a corner. And then immediately realize maybe verbalize, it's not good to get angry. Henceforth, I will not get angry. But after 10 minutes, same stimulus, same anger. The question is, at the time when you are angry, where were you? Understand this question very clearly. At the time when you are angry, where were you? What I'm asking is, at the time when you are angry, you are not aware you are angry. And now I can rephrase. At the time when you are angry, if you are aware you are angry, you are no longer angry. It's as simple as that. I'm not playing upon words. At the time when I'm angry, if I'm aware I'm angry, my response will not be damaging. That anger is within my control because I'm aware I'm angry. When a first time mother looks at a two or three year old child, bundle of joy, playing mischief, she shouts, don't do this, do this. She shows she's angry so that she wants to correct this child. 
that anger never disturbs the mother because she is aware this anger is necessary to set this person right but when the same mother gets angry with her husband all hell falls loose because she loses her anger this possibility of awareness if i have to define awareness now define awareness consciousness is always about objects awareness is consciousness of consciousness not easy you can be aware for 1 2 3 seconds then you lose you lose awareness because for lifetime together we have lived life without being aware this is what gurudev says in his most famous statement man is born in sleep lives in sleep dies in sleep life is only a dream from which he never wakes up yes we are we are conscious but we are not aware the moment awareness comes for the first time you start responding to a situation otherwise all the time we are reacting we are just reacting robotically mechanically we are just cause effect cause effect cause effect reacting your capacity to respond happens only when you develop or when you have awareness and only when you are able to respond you become responsible all the times you are irresponsible the whole life we live without assuming this responsibility which is the privilege only of human beings animals do not have awareness they are instinctive they are they are totally driven by instinct that is why in indian philosophy to be born as a human being is considered as the most fortunate occurrence that is why in indian philosophy even for the gods if they have to proceed higher on the path of awareness consciousness they have to take birth as human beings and then go and i said 99.99% of the time 99.99% of the people are not aware awareness is not there so when we talk about a philosophy of spiritual what are we talking about we are talking about a philosophy which tells you can you become aware when you become aware strange things starts happening some person is irritating me irritating me and the anger starts coming up coming up when i am aware that this person is irritating i am getting angry i am looking at my mind getting angry just before that anger explodes i am fully aware the futility of getting angry i am aware of it that response can be going and hold the person give him a nice hug you can totally confuse the person so what is happening what is happening the normal response would have been abusing slapping screaming but you are so much aware of the futility of getting angry and at the last moment you are changing your response because getting angry is not only futile it is foolish only a foolish person can get angry because when you get angry your endocrine glands are secreting hormones which are harmful for you you can justify your anger no this situation demand they must get angry but at the end of the day who is paying the price for that anger you are paying the price for the anger not the person in front so if you are angry at the time when you are angry if you are aware you are no longer angry at the time when you are sad if you are aware you are sad you are no longer sad at the time when you are depressed if you are aware you are depressed you are no longer depressed this is very clear awareness is the cornerstone of yoga therapy the question is how do you instill this forget about instilling how do you first practice in yourself 
then you can talk about it. So, from the stone, the plant, the animal, the human being, from the human being, you go to a Buddha, a Christ, a Mahavira, a Ramana Maharshi, what happens? Same principle, consciousness approaches infinity, matter approaches zero. A Buddha is totally disidentified with the body and the mind. Totally disidentified. There is no I. There is no I at all. There is only awareness. In fact, the word Buddha means awakened one. What is awakening in Buddha? That he was sleeping for 38 years. No, awakened means awareness is awakened. Once that awareness is awakened, there is no going back. Everything happens. The difference between wakefulness and awareness is more than the difference between wakefulness and dreaming. Understand the difference? That is why in Indian philosophy, we say four avastas of consciousness. Jagrita avastha, wakefulness. Swapna avastha, dreaming. Sushupti or nidra, dream sleep, deep sleep. And last one is Turiya. Turiya is pure awareness. So, what is wakefulness compared to dream? So, sometimes we have a nightmare of a dream. And when you wake up, the first thing is you feel so nice. Oh, it was only a dream. It was not reality. So, the difference between your wakefulness and your dream is lesser compared to the difference between your awareness and wakefulness. Just think, if we start becoming aware, what happens? There is no question of yamas, niyamas necessary. Awareness will ensure that there is no wrong things happening. So when we talk about spirituality or spiritual alignment or spiritual progress, evolution, rising higher in spirituality, it only means becoming more and more aware. And the taste of awareness, formally, you get in meditative states. So if Purusha and Prakriti, principle of consciousness and principle of matter, make everything in the universe, human being is also made of Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is the principle of consciousness in me, I'm conscious. Prakriti is the principle of matter. The matter in me is the body and the mind. Very clear. Clear definition. Sankhya personality of human being. Human being is comprised of two principles, consciousness and matter. Consciousness is very clear. Matter is body and mind. Body is referred to as gross matter, stula sharira. Mind is referred to as sukshma sharira, subtle body. I'm not going into discussing about what the mind is made up of. I will come to that along with the physical body, Sula Sharira, that is made up of Pancha Mahabhutas, the five elements. We have, you know, we have got the Tanmatras, Shabda Sparsha, Rupa, Sagandha, the five senses of knowledge, five senses of action, all of them belong to the subtle body. But our topic is the mind. So, in short, human being is made up of the body-mind on one side and the consciousness on the other side. The basic question is, out of these two parts in me, who am I? What is my reality? This is a basic fundamental question of all Indian philosophy. Who am I? And in the ignorance of knowing this answer, all my sufferings in life, all dukkha is because I don't know my reality. So according to Sankhya, what is the reality? Reality, R capital. Reality, R capital in any philosophy, Indian philosophy stands for something which is permanent, something eternal, something which is immutable. Apply that definition to your body. Is the body permanent? 
Is the body not mutable? Is there no change in the body? No, every moment the body changes. What about the mind? The mind changes more than the body. Every moment, my emotions, my feelings are changing. You don't have to go so much. If you know the guna theory, you know Prakriti is made up of three gunas. Three gunas are continuously changing. So anything that comes from Prakriti is continuously changing. So the body and the mind coming from Prakriti is continuously changing. It does not come under the definition of reality or capital. I have got two parts in me. The body and mind on one side, consciousness on the other side. The body and the mind are not my reality. Then what is left? Only consciousness. My reality is consciousness. Consciousness is the spirit or the spiritual part. I am basically a spiritual being. It is a misnomer, ignorance to say human beings should become spiritual. No. We are spiritual in the first place. We are spiritual beings who should become human. It is not human beings becoming spiritual. We are by definition spiritual beings. We are supposed to become human. Now, if that consciousness in me is my reality, what is my ignorance because of which all sufferings happen? The ignorance in me, the basic ignorance in me, is that not realizing that consciousness is my real me, I start identifying with the body and the mind as my reality. So what happens? When the body grows old, I say, I am growing old. No, you are not growing old. Your body is growing old. Where are you growing old? Your consciousness. When the body falls sick, I say, I am sick. No, you are not sick. The body is sick. When the mind is sad, you say, I am sad. No, you are not sad. Your mind is sad. You are not the mind. All my problems in life, sufferings in life is because of wrongful identification with the body and mind as my reality. So if I have to get rid of my sufferings, I have to stop identifying with the body and the mind. I have to separate myself from the body and the mind. Me is consciousness. Unfortunately, despite modern medicine having developed so much, there is no surgery which can remove your consciousness from the body and the mind. It is identified. So, what is the way out? Separating the consciousness from the body and the mind is awareness. Now you know what is awareness. Where all the time I identify with my body and mind, the moment I separate, when I separate, what is happening? I am aware of the body and mind as if I am looking somewhere else. So instead of saying my body, I say this body. Slight separation. With the body, you can look at a distance. Awareness is rather easy. When your leg gets fractured, you don't say, I am fractured. You say, my leg is fractured. So there is a distinction between you and your leg. But when it comes to the mind, gone. You cannot separate. Because for lives together, we have been identifying, identifying, identifying. The moment you start doing meditation, start being meditative and look at yourself. In retrospect, all of us are wiser. You get angry, do the damage and say, I should not have got angry. The question is, at the time when you're angry, do you know you're angry? That is awareness. Retrospect knowledge is very easy. But real time, being aware of what's happening to me at this point of time, is very crucial, which is not easy. When you are alone, to some extent you can see. I mean, you can sit on the seaside 
and watch the sea is in front, but you are watching your mind. Oh, this mind was so happy in the morning. I met this person. It's watching the mind. But the moment a dog barks from the back, you get up and start eating and now gone. Awareness is gone completely. Awareness requires continuous practice, practice, practice. Not easy. Not easy at all. When you disidentify with the body and the mind, you are separating yourself from sufferings in life. The spiritual part or the consciousness in you slowly starts becoming more and more. The body and the mind starts becoming less and less. You're watching yourself when you're saying, oh, this mind is very sad today. Oh, this mind is very happy. Oh, this mind is depressed. You're watching it. It is not having total control over you. Otherwise, the mind totally controls over you. When you watch your own mind at the time when it is going through emotions as if you're watching the mind of somebody else, the mind has no control over you. You can actually control the mind. You say, oh, it's sad. Oh, poor fellow, it's sad today. Oh, it's happy. Keep on watching. Now you will understand the definition of yoga in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is restrained to the point of stopping of mental modifications. If I tell you, you must separate your consciousness from your mind, then I'm sure if each of you start thinking, you'll have one common question. And that is, okay, show me my mind, I will separate. And now I'm asking you a question. Where is the mind in you? Think. Here is the brain. Here is the heart, lungs, stomach, kidney, liver. Where is the mind? The mind does not have a structural presence in the body. The mind comes into existence only functionally. When there is a thought, my mind is thinking. When there is a desire, my mind is desiring. There is no structural presence for the mind. It's only functional presence. So what does Patanjali say is the definition of yoga? Yoga ha chitvritti nirodaha. Yoga is the restraint to the point of stopping of mental modifications. What is mental modification? Whenever you have an experience, your mind modifies. Vritti is a modification. Chitta is mind. Whenever you have an experience, the mind modifies. So what does Patanjali say? He says, stop all that. Stop all that mental modifications. Means what? Stop all the experiences. When you stop all your experiences, what happens to the mind? The mind is not there. Because the mind comes only when the functioning of the mind is there. When you stop all the functions of the mind, where is the mind? There is no mind. The third sutra is very clear. Tadahad rashtu surupe avasthanam. At that point of time, when all the functioning of the mind stops, the drashtu or the seer, the purusha, is established in its own nature. It's pure consciousness. Otherwise, all the time it identifies with the chitta vrittis. When the chitta vrittis stop, when the mind stops, your consciousness for the first time established itself in its own nature. Now look at all the meditation that you do, any form of meditation you do. When you sit down and close your eyes, what are you trying to do? You're trying to still the mind. No thought, no feeling, no emotion, slow, 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 slow. When the mind becomes totally blank, Chitta Vritti Nirodha has happened. When Chitta Vritti Nirodha has happened, no Vritti is in the Chitta, no modification, no experience in the Chitta, your consciousness for the first time is established in own nature. It's pure awareness. It's just pure consciousness. You are established in your real nature. So the definition of yoga is very clear. That 
stop the chitta vrittis the chitta stops patanjali does not say yoga ha chitta nirodha ha is a chitta vritti nirodha ha because chitta cannot be stopped there is no chitta there is no sexual presence if that is understood then we see the significance of awareness meditation and like what we talked about in the morning it is not doing yoga which is important but being yogic which is important all 24 hours in the same manner it is not doing meditation which is important but being meditative throughout the day is important what is it being meditative being meditative means being aware can i be aware can i be aware can i stop my reactions all the time can i stop reacting to situations to people to happenings in life can i be in the moment your awareness brings you to the present moment when the mind is there the mind goes to the past or the future when the mind is not there you are always in the present so what i talked in the morning just one hour back atha yoga nishasanam now the discipline of yoga the meaning is the discipline of yoga is of the now can i come to the now and that coming to the now is awareness it can be popularized in any different way but at the end of the day it is so practical that can i so just two points before we go ahead if you want to develop this awareness two hints your level of awareness is inversely proportional to the speed of your activity the slower you do something more the capacity of being aware the faster you do something lost awareness is lost that is why in classical yoga in patanjali's yoga your yoga asanas have to be done very slowly if i am sleeping i cannot raise my hand leg up this way no i have to raise the leg up slowly because every moment i have got awareness every moment i have got awareness i can't raise it up here if i raise it up this fast awareness is here and it is here in between i have lost the awareness asana practice is a tool of meditation that is why patanjali says i mean what is the definition and methodology of asanas patanjali says sthira sukham asanam any posture which is sthira stable and comfortable is asan and if i have to redefine this and make it applicable to life any posture which is stable because you are comfortable is an asan you can never become stable in life if you are not comfortable take any seat you can sit uncomfortable for some time after that you will have to get up take any relationship for stability you require comfort again he says how do we do asans prayatna shaitilya ananta samapatti bhyam when i do asans my efforts have to progressively lessen down why efforts have to come down because when you put efforts in an asan efforts is the presence of mind and we are going towards chitta vritti nirodha the more efforts you put the more mind comes there prayatna shaitilya effortlessness does not mean not to put efforts it means can i do my asan gracefully no efforts at all it's just the grace of doing the asan there and if you do that what happens ananta samapatti bhyam samapatti means fusion there is a fusion with the concept of infinity you become totally in a meditative state now understand very clearly if your level of awareness is inversely proportional to the speed of your activity the slower i do the more awareness i have so if i am the asan i am doing very slowly very slowly very slowly fine awareness is very very high awareness and now i come to the final pose okay very much awareness increases and when i stop here no moment at all what happens to your awareness 
I'm asking mathematical question. When you do slow movement, your awareness increases. So slower the movement, more awareness. When the movement stops, what happens to awareness? It is infinite. Because till the moment is there, your awareness becomes slower. When the moment stops, your awareness is infinite. That is Anathasamapati Bham. You are merging with infinity. That is why in yoga asanas, in Patanjali's way, it is not number of times you do asanas which is important. It is one time and slow as possible, as slow as possible, because asanas are not meant for the body. Asanas are meant for honing the mind. Can I develop awareness? Physical fitness happens automatically, but every asana is a tool of meditation, a piece of art. Can I do it very slowly, very slowly, so that my mind is there? You cannot do an asana thinking, what is there for breakfast? Who am I meeting today? If you're doing it in the form of an asana, then you can do mechanically and the mind can go here and there. When you do slowly, your mind is there. And the slower, awareness more, when it stops, infinite. And when that happens, what happens? Patanjali says, tatha dvandhana vighata. If you do asans in that manner, all conflicts in life will go. Definitely it will go. Because your mind is so peaceful. It's very clear what he's talking about. He's not talking diabetes will go, hypertension will go, acidity will go, obesity will go. He's not talking that. Because that is not important. That will go even otherwise it will go. What has to go is conflicts in the mind. Your mind becomes so peaceful. You can see this. Try tomorrow when you do your asana practice, immediately after that, you do shavasana practice. 12 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Immediately after shavasana, get up and try to get angry. See if it is possible. It is not possible. Because the mind has been given so much stimulus of parasympathetic nervous system, that is totally cooled down. How will it get angry? It will take time to get angry. It will not get angry. So, the body and the mind on one side, consciousness on the other side, you are the consciousness. This body and the mind are your false self. You have to disidentify. The way of disidentification is awareness. That is why in Indian philosophy, even if a person commits suicide, his problems will not get over. Because only the mind goes, the body goes. The mind is still there. The mind and the consciousness are still there. In these two parts, the body, mind on one side, consciousness on one side. Now, if I come to the language of Indian philosophy, this consciousness is under the bondage of this body and mind. So when we talk about we are in bondage, it is the consciousness in me which is bonded, which is bound by this body and mind. So, when an individual dies, the person is either cremated or buried. In either which way, the body disintegrates and merges with the universal element. If the body is cremated, the body becomes ash. Ash is earth element. If the body is buried, the bones, the flesh, the everything becomes earth element. The water element me evaporates, becomes water. The space element me becomes the space there. Air element becomes air. So my body, which is made up of five elements, disintegrates, becomes one with the universal elements. What happens to the mind and the consciousness? It's a big question. Because the consciousness is bound by the mind. Time is up, no? Last point. This consciousness and this mind is what takes birth again. Where does it take birth? This mind, which we talk about, Sukshma Sharida, by which the consciousness is bound, this mind is the repository of all the actions that you have done now. Good actions, bad actions, karma. And for all those actions for which you have not got the results, 
you cannot escape scot free you can hoodwink you can deceive human law system legal system cosmic law you cannot deceive it is infallible inviolable so if there are so many actions which are done for which i have not got fruits i will have to take birth again so what takes birth this con this consciousness bound by the mind takes birth again in life when a birth takes place the physical body is the genes of the parents mind is your own it is on an onward journey from life after life if from childhood onwards your personality depends upon nature and nurture we talk about in psychology that your personality is based upon nature and nurture nature is what is given to you by parents nurture is how you are brought up if that is the case twins to a parents should have the same personality because the genes are the same they are born in the same house they are brought up in the same environment siblings should have the same personality why only twins siblings should also have the same personality but you will find by 10 11 12 the twins i'm more interested in twins siblings okay fine the twins can have such different personality that one is totally opposite to the other why because the body is given by the parents their genes but the mind is on an onward journey so whatever progress you make in this life of culturing the mind honing the mind making it meditative whatever efforts you make never gone waste maybe you are not reaching the goal in this life but these efforts never go waste because your mind is so much purified so next life you start on a better scale on a better platform death is only a comma not a full stop and this is not only indian philosophy in all philosophies all religions is the same thing if you take christianity if you take islam it is not the case that you live life this way and for all your actions you escape scot free no on the day of judgment god resurrects you physically weighs your actions on scales depending upon good actions bad actions if good actions are more you are blessed with heaven if bad actions are more you are doomed to hell you can never get scot free by any action that you perform in indian philosophy you don't have to wait for day of judgment every lifetime you are paying the price for what you have done in the past life and today this is not a figment today we know concepts like deja vu we know that you go to a place and you say i have been here i have been here i know this i know this where have you been where have you been what happens is in that state from death to birth is a total amnesia i am not able to remember in fact studies done show that small babies who are 3 4 days old sometimes they will fast asleep and they start laughing small child they remember the past but the moment that Three months, four months happens. That past is completely gone, and it's a fresh life. We also have dreams. We have in meditative experiences where we come to the conclusion: it's very weird dream I had. What is weird? Weird means I don't know how this dream has come to me. I've never experienced this earlier. Yeah, you're not experienced only in this life. In the past life, there's so many experiences you don't know. Last point: the psychiatrist from US by the name of Brian Weiss. has today made a therapy so popular called plr past life regression where when psychoanalyzing one person accidentally stumbles to the past of past life of the person and then finds that for the present day emotional disturbances there is no present life cause but the cause was there in the past life there are number of individuals have come across 
typically with shoulder pain, excruciating shoulder pain. The X-ray says nothing wrong with the shoulder. MRI says nothing wrong with the shoulder. But the person says it is not mental, psychological. I'm having physical pain, severe pain. When this person's psychologist goes back, 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 you remember at some point of time, there was an injury to the shoulder. Now in this life, the shoulder is new, but the memory of the pain of past is now projected on the shoulders. It is a healthy shoulder, but the memory of past is projected on this. Unless it is psychoanalyzed, it will not remain. It's not psychological. It is there. But clinically, there is nothing wrong. So, the consciousness is bound to the mind. I will stop here, yeah? Is it okay if I continue just five minutes? Is it okay for all of you? Yeah? Five minutes more, just to give you practical tips. The practical tips that I want to give is just two, three things. Sense organs are always in the present. Mind invariably is in the past or the future. The first problem. Going to the past and the future is a blessing for human species. We have survived because of this capacity of the mind to go to the past and the future. Because we become wiser by the past and we prepare for the future. But unfortunately, the same capacity of going to the past and the future is the worst curse of the human being. Because even when it is not necessary, habitually the mind goes to the past or the future. You are never in the present. What is past is over. What is future has not yet come. Life is only the present. Now add the two together. Life is only the present. Mind is always in the past or the future. You will come to a very gloomy conclusion. And that is, we are not living at all. When I am eating now, I am thinking of what is there for lunch or dinner. I'm reading the book here, but the mind is there. What will I do in the evening? Yoga is, can I bring that mind for, from its wanderings in the past and the future? Can it come to the moment? First principle of yoga. Again, this mind is a central sense organ. Chief sense organ. It is the mind which makes the other five sense organs effective. I can see without looking. I can hear without listening. I can touch without feeling. I can eat without tasting. What is the difference? At this point of time, I presume you're listening to me. But at this point of time, there are a number of sounds which are hitting your eardrum. You are hearing those sounds, you are not listening because your mind is focused through your ears to me. So you are listening to my sound, but hearing is that some other things are being heard. You can touch without feeling. Only when the mind is there in the touch, it is feeling. Other is just touching. I can eat, but if the mind is not there, I don't taste. I only eat. See the difference? It is the mind which makes the sense organs effective. Not only that, we are really blessed that this mind can work through more than one sense organ at the same time. We have got five sense organs. At this point of time, your mind through your eyes is looking at me, through your ears is listening to me. That is why when we want to talk something important to a person, we say, not on the phone, let's meet. Why? Because when you're talking on the phone, only one sense organ is getting involved. When you meet the person, you can see the person, two senses are involved. The more sense organs coming to your activity, the more proficiency, more knowledge, more expertise, more skill in that activity. 
Patanjali gives a beautiful sutra. Tat upraga pishita chittasya vastu gnyata agnyatam. Your knowledge, your efficiency, your expertise on his topic is directly proportional to how much you allow that topic to color your mind. And the coloring of the mind happens only through sense organs. So if you give a small toy, colorful toy to a child, a tiny toy which is sitting with great difficulty, you give a nice toy. What does it do? It holds, eyes are popping out, beautiful colors. Then it starts turning, it's feeling. And before the mother comes, it puts in the mouth. What is the child doing? It is experiencing that object from as many sense organs as possible. Because it knows more sense organs I bring, the better I know this object. So, the secret of excellence in life is how many sense organs can I bring to an activity at hand? And we were discussing and Deepakji made it successful in our retreat that when the food was served, we made the food very colorful. So the first, your eyes are taking the food. Then when you go close, the aroma of the food is coming to the nostril. Then, if you eat the food Indian way, you are touching it. Touch is coming. Then when you put it in the mouth, the taste, and then when you chew it, and there, the sound of the chewing, your nutrition from the food is five times. This is not an exaggeration. This is not mathematics. This is actually the case. Today, dietitians and nutritions follow this principle. They serve the food, make it very colorful. Like what I talked about going to the past and the future, this very capacity of dealing with more than one sense organs at the same time is the worst curse of the human being. Because he has one mobile here, one laptop here, one music plug here, one person standing and is talking. What is happening? What he is doing is, he gives a respectable name. You know what is a respectable name? This name is called multitasking. This is the worst thing that you can ever do to your mind. Patanjali says, Eka samechu ubaya anavadharanam. At one point of time, two experiences are not possible. If you are having a remote on your hand and eating, the moment you get good taste, you lost the scene on the TV. When you have got a good scene on the TV, you lost the taste. You cannot have both. Ek samechu ubaya anavadharanam. So what am I doing? I am giving five inputs to my mind. It's not multitasking, it is mutilating the mind. You are cutting the mind into pieces and giving respectively to yourself that I am a very capable person, I am doing multitasking. No, you are the most foolish person. And research has shown that in a limited time, when you do one work at a time linearly, you are able to accomplish much more than what you can do by so-called multitasking. Not only quantity-wise, even quality-wise you can do more. You have to understand the mind, how it is functioning. I will stop here. I can go on. Sorry, what are this? So ah. trust in here, Lori. Ah, good. And face the audience. Face the audience. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have wow. a grateful appreciation of Dr. Ganesh Rao, honoring those who embody and elevate the spirit of Swadhyaya and Abhyasa and Sangha. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, Deepak, for assisting with all of the transport and the, and the attending. Yeah, and thank you, Emily, 
and thank you, Ayana and Laura and 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 Jackie and Shuo and Gayatri and so so we're so glad to be with you in this space here and beyond. And we look forward to your return visit. Thank you very much. I'm enjoying the